Howdy, everybody. Today we are picking up with the road to Ronald Reagan. So before we get to Reagan, we gotta talk about his predecessor, Jimmy Carter, for a little bit. Now, Jimmy Carter is gonna be one of the nicest presidents we've ever had, genuinely. Like after he left office, he ends up curing diseases all around the world. So he's a really great guy. But unfortunately for Jimmy Carter, pretty much everything during his term as president goes wrong, and nothing he does to fix some of these problems goes the way he hopes. So we left off with Gerald Ford. So remember, Ford took over for Nixon after Nixon was facing impeachment, Nixon resigned, and Ford became president because he was that kind of appointed vice president. So he's one of the few presidents who have to hold the office without actually being elected. Now, the convention for the Republicans was close. Ford was wanting to run for re-election, but a new competitor, Reagan, had come onto the scene. And Reagan had been governor of California, had been very popular, and he really gave Ford a run for his money. A really big challenge to Ford's run for the presidency. But Ford manages to eke out a small majority and gets the Republican nomination. But the Democrats are going to choose Jimmy Carter. Now, Carter was a little-known politician at the time. Not many people knew much about him. But he is a governor from Georgia, and his unknown quality kind of gives him his in. He says, I'm an outsider. I'm not corrupted by the politics going on at this point in time in Washington. Furthermore, After all the mess with Nixon making the Republicans look really bad, when Carter said, I will never lie to you, he had a reputation for honesty. And this is something Americans really wanted to believe in after the debacle with Nixon. And so Carter was elected in 1976, and he would have the misfortune of being the president during the horrible economic crises and political crises of the 1970s. Now, something unique is going to happen to Carter economically that many economists weren't sure could actually happen until it did. This is an idea called stagflation, where you have a decrease in economic growth, growth, but an increase in inflation. Unemployment was around 8%, and inflation hovered at around 10%. So these were not the worst times, but they certainly weren't good times. And everything Carter tried to do to fix the problem either didn't work or made things worse. At first, he tried to solve the problem by launching a massive government spending program in the model of FDR's New Deal. But that didn't solve the problem, so he went the other direction and cut government spending dramatically, and that just made things worse. So in the long run, he ended up just making everybody angry. And it wasn't necessarily for any fault of his own. He didn't cause the crisis. He didn't cause this weird economic anomaly to happen. But everything he tried either didn't work or made things worse. And then something even worse is going to make or going to happen to make Carter look ineffective. And it's going to be the Iranian Revolution. So Iran is or for a long time had been an ally of the United States, had been working with us, and Iran, prior to the revolution, was a very familiar place to many Westerners, many Western European and Americans. It looked at least very familiar. So it looked like the 70s anywhere else in the world, for the most part. So women had access to rights, schools, everything else. There was relative equality. Things were okay. You know, they were very similar to many other countries around the world. Now, the leader of Iran was known as the Shah. So this is the Shah of Iran. Now, he had long been an ally of the United States. We had helped kind of get him into power. And he was a friend of ours. That being said, he's also a dictator. And there were, while there's a lot of civil liberties in Iran under his rule, there's also a lot of kind of dictatorial problems. People disagree with him or challenge him. They can be disappeared and things like this. So it's just, it's not, it looks better than it might actually be, but there's still a lot of anger under the surface, particularly the fact that they, the Iranians feel that he is not their chosen leader, that they didn't pick him. He was kind of put in power by the United States. 
And this is going to lead to anger. That's going to begin bubbling up. And in January of 1979, this is going to erupt in a revolution that brought a new Islamic state into control of the country. One of the first moves of the new Iranian regime was to stop shipments of oil to the United States that they dubbed the Great Satan. The leaders of the Iranian revolution were not happy with the United States, especially because we had essentially installed that previous Shah, whom they were rebelling against. And they did not, as you imagine, or you, this did not, as you can imagine, help our economy much. When they cut off oil supplies, that's going to shoot the price of oil up again. And then OPEC raises the price of oil 50% even on top of that. When the deposed Shah of Iran needed to come to the United States for medical care for his incurable cancer, we gave him protection. The Carter administration said, yes, this is basically an acknowledgement for all of his help and support for the United States. In retaliation on November 4th, 1979, fundamentalist Muslim students seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran in flagrant violation of the principle of diplomatic immunity. American diplomats and their families were taken hostage under demands that the United States return the Shah to Iran for trial and punishment for his crimes during his regime. Carter refused and froze Iranian assets in the United States and American banks and demanded the release of, 52, of the 52 American hostages. For the next 14 months, the Iranian hostage crisis paralyzed the Carter administration. Night after night, humiliating pictures of blindfolded hostages appeared on TV. Now there was one attempt to rescue the hostages and it failed miserably in April of 1980, about six months into the crisis. Two helicopters failed in or crashed in the desert and another hit a US cargo plane killing eight of the attempting rescuers. So even our rescues were being bumbled. So this is not a great thing. This is making Carter overall look like an utter and complete failure. The economy was taking, tanking worse than ever. So the Fed raised their interest rates to the highest ever at this point, 20%. And the Adanian hostage crisis made Carter seem weak and ineffective, unable to do anything even to protect American citizens. So let's put it this way. By the late 1970s, Carter's approval ratings were at 26%. That's two points lower than Nixon's were at the time of his proposed impeachment. So the terrible situation under Carter in the late 1970s made it look right for a Republican takeover and a Republican comeback in the next election, which has simply been unthinkable after Nixon and Ford. Now, on top of this, you have the South kind of leaving the Democratic Party in droves because of civil rights. And we kind of touched on this before. So it starts off with the Depression and the New Deal with that first big push. And these New Deal Democrats like LBJ were more willing to push for civil rights and social programs. And the best example of kind of this fracturing is, of course, LBJ. But it's ultimately going to be civil rights that makes the difference. The South does not want to support civil rights. So the South is going to leave the Democratic Party and flood into the Republican Party. And the failures of Johnson kind of make way for Republicans in the South. And we see this happening in 1960 initially in Texas when John Tower is elected. Now this is the result of this changing political demographic in the state. So in 1960, LBJ vacated his Senate seat when he was elected as vice president with JFK. There was a special election in Texas to fill the open seat, and the man named John Tower won this. What was remarkable was that Tower won over a conservative Democrat named William Blakely, and that Tower was a Republican. So this means that a conservative Republican can beat a conservative Democrat, which hasn't happened in the South for decades since the Civil War. So Texas had elected its first Republican senator since Reconstruction, something that was inconceivable before the New Deal and World War II. Now, Tower was, in fact, the first Republican elected by popular vote in the entire former Confederacy. So this is a big and significant change during this time. More dramatically, in 1978, 
Bill Clements is elected as governor. So the Republican Party put him up for nomination for their candidate as governor. Now, normally, this would mean Clements is kind of the whipping boy of the Democratic Party. But because of this growing Democratic and Republican shift in political spectrums, it's going to go very different. And the difference was, now the Republican Party in Texas had become tremendously competitive in Texas since the mid-1960s. And in the end, he's going to manage to win a narrow victory. Clements had 49.9% of the vote compared to 49.2% of the vote for his Democratic opponent. Now, Clements had swung the governor's mansion back to the public Republicans for the first time in 105 years. And all these changes that are occurring across the South and this new conservative base for the Republican Party is going to help change things and kind of open the door, pave the path for Reagan to come in. Now, talking a little bit about Reagan, if you don't know who Reagan was, aside from him being president at one point in time, he initially started off as kind of a B-list movie, movie and TV actor. He did such great shows as Bedtime for Bonzo and different things like that. So he wasn't exactly top tier actor, but he was a prominent actor, well known, and he's slowly going to work his way into politics. Now initially he started off as a Democrat when they were more conservative, but as this shift, shift happened, in 1962 he swung his support behind the Republicans instead. So you kind of see Ronald Reagan, as he gets older, starting to take a more active role in politics and kind of pushing the political spectrum. But it's going to be his support of Barry Goldwater, who we mentioned in a previous election in 1964 against LBJ. Now, he's going to give a speech called A Time for Choosing. And he's going to make clear that the 1960s were a time to decide between big government and little government. And Reagan stressed his belief in the importance of a smaller government. And in his speech, he revealed his ideological motivations. Now, I attached a speech in Blackboard so you can watch it there, but I'll read a little bit here now. He said, quote, the founding fathers knew a government can't control the economy without controlling the people. And they knew when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. So we have come to a time of choosing. Now, Goldwater lost in 1964, but this speech and his support of Goldwater is going to propel Reagan to the forefront of the Republican Party. Now, Reagan's going to run for governor of California in 1966 and won decisively and served until 1975. Now, during his tenure as California governor, he's actually going to raise taxes. Now, this is an important thing to recognize. Because what he's going to do as president later on is going to be the exact opposite and is expecting the same results. So he is going to actually raise taxes, which is how he's going to turn a state deficit into a surplus that does a lot of good for California. Now, throughout his time, he had become the major figure in the Republican Party. Remember, he almost got the Republican nomination over Gerald Ford in the previous election. So when 1980 came, the Republicans quickly turned to Ronald Reagan as their chosen candidate. Now in the 1980s, when the 1980 came, 1980 election came in the shadow of the horrific economic crisis and the Iranian hostage crisis, it doesn't look like there's much hope for Jimmy Carter. And Reagan is kind of hitting the ground running with a very dominant position. And everything came down to pretty much the only debate between the two candidates. And this is going to kind of be the deciding factor because allegedly at this point in time, polls indicated that they were in a dead heat, kind of neck and neck, which is hard to believe given how unpopular Jimmy Carter was. But in these debates, Carter came off as defensive and Reagan came off as charming and confident, which is not surprising. Carter had been on his heels since he took over as president with all the problems going on during his term. And Reagan was perfectly suited for speeches on TV. This is exactly his kind of bailiwick. This is what he specializes in as an actor. And the clincher came at the end of the debate when Reagan looked into the camera and said the obvious thing. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? And if not, 
you should probably vote for me. Now, not many Americans are going to be better off than they were four years ago when Carter took over. Now, I've attached that clip too, so you can kind of see him talking a little bit more on that part of the speech. But this is going to win him a massive landslide of the election. Now, he's elected by this new right, this conservative, more religious component of the Republican Party that is growing in political significance. So Reagan took 51% of the popular vote, but in the Electoral College, he gets 489 votes to Carter's 49 votes. So this is a massive support. And what's even worse, Reagan wins, which is already insult to injury for Carter, but to kind of salt the wound. Literally minutes after Reagan gets inaugurated as president, Iran decides to release the hostages, which means it's basically just spitting in Carter's face, saying we, on principle, weren't going to give them up during your term. But on top of that, Reagan's like, well, just by becoming president, I solved the greatest problem of the last decade, aside from the economy. So people already are celebrating Reagan as a hero, and he hasn't even done anything. All he's done has been sworn in. Now to tackle the economic crisis, Reagan is going to come up with something called Reaganomics, also known as trickle-down economics. Now, if you remember, just a few minutes ago, I said the way Reagan helped kind of solve the financial problems in California was to raise taxes, use that extra money to provide public support. When he becomes president, he is going to cut taxes, particularly cut taxes on major corporations, because he argues that by giving corporations a big discount on their taxes, They'll reinvest that money into their company. That'll trickle down, providing more jobs, more benefits, all these kinds of things. And in 1981, he passes and signs the Economic Recovery Tax Act, which cuts taxes across the board by 25%. So this is a massive tax cut for everybody, but especially big business. Now, there's also many cuts in federal spending to things like food stamp, unemployment compensation, and welfare programs. All those social entitlements like Social Security and Medicare, which is particularly targeted at the older generation, which makes up uh, the biggest base of the Republican Party at the time, and still today, is protected. So he knew what he was doing. He knew who to target and who he could hit without getting repercussions. Now, we've cut taxes. So that's the first step of this, thinking it'll trickle down to the lower level people in these big companies. But the second thing he does is he dramatically ramps up military spending and basically starts a new arms race with the Soviet Union. Now the biggest part of his plan is announced in 1983. It's called the Strategic Defense Initiative, which becomes known as the Star Wars program. You know, he kind of borrows that name from the popular movie from the era. Now with this initiative, the deficit budget swelled to over $100 billion a year. And this was based on Reagan's approach to the Cold War, engage the Russians in the nuclear and technological arms race, ramp up this economic competition, and bet on the United States that we could support this kind of deficit spending longer than the Russians could, and it would drive the Soviet Union into economic collapse. Now, Reagan didn't know the situation of the Cold War or of the Soviet Union at this time, but we'll get to that in just a second. A bit more on this Star Wars program. So this is really thinking of kind of future warfare. So many of the technology that's developed at this point in time is still technology that we are either developing or still using today. So you have interceptor missiles to shoot down incoming enemy missiles then you have what really is the kind of future technology, which is high energy weapons, such as X-ray lasers, chemical lasers, neutral particle beams, and hypervelocity rail guns. And like things like a rail gun have just started coming into effect kind of in the past five years or so being put on US Navy ships. Then you have space-based programs like Brilliant Pebbles, which launch tungsten projectiles shot to intercept missiles from outer space. Now, all of this was to ramp up this economic military arms race 
with Russia to drive them into economic collapse. Now, what Reagan didn't know is by spending all this money, we were actually significantly outpacing what Russia could do. But Russia, in order to not save or lose face, in order to save face and not lose it during the Cold War, they ramped up spending to compete with us. What was really unknown to Reagan was that Russia was already at a tenuous breaking point with their economic situation. And the push of this new arms race was going to push the Soviet Union over the edge. But as a result, you have this ballooning federal deficit. So you see, after Roosevelt and World War II, once Truman takes over, you have this slow decline of kind of the federal deficit. Then you see the eight years of Reagan begin to spike up. Then you have Bush, who was Reagan's vice president, continue the spike. So you see some of these major issues starting to go into effect, and you're gonna have major ramifications that Bush is gonna to have to deal with after Reagan. So the Cold War is getting colder, the deficit is soaring, yet inflation was down, and so was unemployment. And most important of all, the American economy seemed to be stronger and growing. And this is always what matters in any presidential election. Despite the growing deficit, the economy seemed to be doing better. So in 1984, when Reagan runs for re-election, his campaign speech is, it's morning again in America. Kind of, a new age has dawned, and I helped make that possible. Now, Reagan is going to trounce his Democratic opponent, Walter Mondale. And he will take 60% of the popular vote and 525 electoral votes compared to Mondale's 13. So this is a massive landslide victory for Reagan. People love Reagan. And as we keep talking about Reagan, this is an exciting time in American history, kind of a different time. We are entering into the 1980s in kind of this new changing age. This is the era of MTV and Michael Jackson and Frogger and Madonna and this whole new strange personal computer thing. So in 1981, MTV comes on the air. This is music television. And at this point in time, MTV showed only music videos. All the time, round the clock, this is what they showed. And this is going to change how people consume music and TV and videos and all these kinds of things. And it became so successful that in 1985, it spawned another network, Video Hits One, more commonly known as VH1. Now keep in mind, at this point in time, they were almost exclusively music shows or shows talking about music. There wasn't really any reality TV or any extra stuff at this point in time. It was almost exclusively music. Now, the artist that's going to really change MTV and change the way artists make music and make videos for their music is going to be Michael Jackson particularly with his 1982 release of the song Thriller. And I have the video linked, it's about eight minute long video, which is surprisingly long at this point in time, because it's not just a normal music video, where you know you sing, you dance, you do your normal stuff. But he actually builds a whole narrative arc into Thriller, where it's like this mini short film telling an overarching story, but through this song. Now this is going to make it an absolute hit. It sold half a million copies every single week until it reached 47 million copies around the world. Absolutely amazing. But Thriller is also going to captivate American audiences in a whole new way. And it sets the bar of what it takes to make a movie, to make one of these music videos going forward. Now on the flip side, if he's the king of pop, you have Madonna as the queen of pop during this time. And she is going to push a lot of gender boundaries, a lot of social boundaries, really challenging kind of personal style, personal development, personal rights, women's rights, how women fit into the world. And songs like Like a Virgin and all these different things are going to challenge social norms in crucial and important ways. Now, her style became one of the primary female fashion trends of the era, whatever she did all through the 80s and early 90s, people mimic, people copied her style. Now, as the music industry is changing and TV is changing, home personal computers are changing. So in the 1950s, 
This is what computing looked like. Big blocks of computers to just do basic computing. So this would be what this is less than what our cell phones could do today. This is less than what many calculators can do today. But this is what it started as, the IBM 610s, massive computers. Now, you start getting some of the first more compact computers. Now, we call this compact at this point in time, but today, this is huge. And these are pretty basic things. And you notice they don't have any kind of graphics processing. It is simply text-based, no mouse. It's all key commands. So these are pretty basic computers, but they're smaller, more manageable, more can be done with them. Then you have the PC revolution with the Apple II, produced by Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs in 1977. Now this allows computers to come into the homes for the very first time. Now keep in mind, still no graphics, still no mouse. So these are the key components, it's all text-based. You gotta know your text commands in order to be able to use it. So you have to basically speak a second language in order to run these things. Then IBM is gonna change the concept of the whole computer, making it really accessible to the average person, really allowing it to come into the house in a major way for the first time. But it's gonna be Bill Gates that develops a challenging operating system to beat Apple, to beat some of the IBM processing things called Windows. Now Windows is gonna have two major changes, which I'm sure you can see is obvious from this picture. You have a mouse, which lets you visibly and physically control something, but you also have a graphics user interface. That means you have a picture that you can interact with, which simplifies things dramatically. You no longer have to hit like an execute command to open a file. You can now just point your cursor at it, click it, and it opens. So you're also, shortly after Windows comes out, you have the compact disk coming into existence as well. Now compact is going to develop the first kind of laptop. And this is gonna change business and computing in a whole new way. But we'll stop there for today and we'll pick up with the second part of Reagan and the age of the yuppie next time.